we're going to talk about Nathaniel, John chapter 1, verse 43 to 49. We're going to read there. And I promise you this, that at some point today I'm going to call Nathaniel Nicodemus. Is that okay? Because that's just, you know, uh, sometimes we, we, we say the wrong name and I know what's going to happen. So just I apologize in advance for calling him Nicodemus. John chapter 1, 43 to 49. I'm going to read that being here. It says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can any good thing come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So as we've looked at the disciples, this whole series of disciples, we, we've seen that there were some disciples Jesus had a lot of conversations with, and there are some disciples that it's just their names listed. And then there's some like Nathanael who has one conversation that's recorded with Jesus. And so it must be a pretty important conversation. So when we look at Nathanael, we got to understand that in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Nathanael's given the name Bartholomew. So that can be confusing, right? But in the Gospel of John, he's called Nathanael. But how many of you have a middle name? I know some of you don't. We found that out on a Wednesday night, and we're still praying about that to give you a middle name. But, but it's kind of like a, a first and last name, right? Like, you know, my, my last name's Cook, right? My first name's Stanley. And so it's kind of a first name, last name kind of thing. So John gives us the, the description that, that Bartholomew from the other Gospels is also Nathaniel. And it's interesting that in the listing of the disciples in, in five different places where it's listed, that Nathaniel always follows Philip. So there's some kind of a friendship there that happened because we know that when Philip was called by Jesus to come follow me, the first thing he did was went to find his friend Nathaniel. So there's a friendship there. There's a, there's a fellowship. There's a whole other sermon there, too, about when we come to Christ, the first people we should go tell are our family and friends, right? We should tell them about Jesus. So it's interesting that I think because of that friendship, the conversation that Philip and Nathaniel have makes more sense because it was the fact that when Philip says, says we found the one, Jesus of Nazareth, and, and Nathaniel goes, Nazareth? Can any good thing come of Nazareth? That's kind of like in the old days when they'd say, North Lakeland. Can any good thing come from North Lakeland? Amen. Well, they're finding out that there's a great church in North Lakeland anyways, right? And so uh, we, we kind of, they kind of scoff. So Nathaniel was, well, the interesting thing was Philip said, come and see. And Nathaniel, in spite of him scoffing at Nazareth and scoffing at the possibility of this, Nathaniel, because of his relationship with Philip, was willing to go see Jesus even though he was unsure if any good thing can come from Nazareth. Listen, some people hold so firmly to what they believe or how they think God should move that they miss what God is actually doing. Don't get caught up in what you think is right that you miss Jesus. The good thing is Nathaniel didn't do that, did he? Nathaniel didn't do that. Nathaniel didn't get caught up in what he thought God should be doing, what he thought the Messiah should be doing. In fact, he went to see Jesus. In verse 48, it says that Jesus saw Nathanael under a fig tree. The, the great thing about this is, is the best part of this little story here is not that Nathanael, in spite of his apprehensions and his unsure about being the guy from Nazareth and still going to see because of his relationship with Philip, the greatest thing and the most important thing about this story isn't that Nathanael went to see Jesus, it's that Jesus saw him. Think about this. John 1 Verse 1 to 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made, and without him nothing was made. And in him was life, and the light that, that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Think about that. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus said, let there be light, and there was light. He created all things. He breathed life into dirt, and humanity was born. That same God is now standing here talking to Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, I saw you, the Messiah, the creator of the heavens and earth, is standing there speaking directly to Nathaniel, and he says, Nathaniel, I saw you. That's the Jesus that saw Nathaniel. 
And just like Jesus saw Nathaniel, he sees you. While you're sitting here in the service this morning, unsure of, some of you are unsure why you even came this morning. Some of you were dragged. Anybody have, a, like when I was a kid, I had a drug problem. Anybody else when they were kids, drug, your mom drug you everywhere, especially to church, man. Just drug you to church, right? And so I had that drug problem. And so some of you were drug, dragged here today. You, you're not sure why you came, but I want you to know that you're here, that the God who created everything sees you and that you're not here by accident. The eyes of the Lord are on all of us. While Nathaniel was under a tree, a fig tree, in isolation by himself where he thought nobody could see him, the creator of all things saw him. And in the same way, when you are isolated, you're hidden by your fig tree, whether that is a, being in a large church where you can blend into a crowd or being in a dark room where you believe that what you are doing in secret can't be seen, the truth is God sees you. God sees you. And I'm glad that God sees me, whether I'm hiding in a big room or in a dark room in my secret place. I'm glad that God sees me because it's liberating to know that God always sees me even in my dark place. God is always looking, always searching for me and finding me. There's both conviction and comfort in knowing that he always sees me. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Understand that this scripture is not written to sinners. It was in the, written in a book that was written to believers. And John is saying to believers, if we as believers will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's comfort in knowing that we are seen by God, even in our dark places. There's a bunch of stories. The Bible is, is littered with stories about God seeing people. So I want to just pick a couple of them today. I could do a lot of them. and We could be here, preach all night like Paul did, right? Anybody ready for that? No? Okay. Hagar. Hagar the horrible. No, that's the wrong person. That's the comic strip. We have a story of Hagar who was a slave, a servant woman who was, was owned, basically owned by Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis 16, I'm not going to take time to read the whole story, but what happens is Abraham was given the promise of a, of a, of a child and that eventually the number of kids, the family that he had would be as numerous as the stars of the sky. And yet here he is about 90 years old and Sarah is about, what, 80 years old and she has no child. And I don't know about, if you know anything about biology, people, Right, 80-year-old women do not normally give birth, nor would you want to, right? And as a 90-year-old guy, it's like, I want great-great-grandkids at 90, not children, even though I love them. But here's the story. So Sarah, Sarah and Abraham, they, they had no children. They had given the promise from God they would have children, and yet here Sarah comes to Abraham and says, the Lord has kept me from having children. So she's already forgetting the promise. And so, so she says, here, go sleep with my slave. Okay, men, listen to this. Listen to this story. And if you're Abram, don't make the same dumb mistake he made. Get me? Okay. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build up the same through So Abram agrees with her. He makes me a problem with that. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Abram, you idiot. What is wrong with you? But Abram was an idiot. So after, but so what happened? Here's what happened. So they took her, the, the Egyptian slave Hagar, and gave her to her husband. And what happened was, she got pregnant, which is what happens when you do those things, right? And so, as she is pregnant, Sarah begins to despise her, right? Because Sarah forgot the promise was through her and Abraham, and now she's despising the fact that she got pregnant. And instead of blaming herself like we so often do, we blame everybody but the person that's the problem. Are you with me? I don't know about you, but when I have a problem, it's usually your fault, not mine. <laughs> right? We're good at pointing fingers, aren't we? Well, if so-and-so wasn't like that, I wouldn't be like that. That's what Sarah was doing. She was blaming Hagar for getting pregnant. So what happens is Hagar... Hagar uh, fled. She fled, and the, and the angel of the Lord, verse 8, the angel of the Lord uh, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that was beside the road to Shur. And he said to Hagar, 
and he, he, he talked to Hagar, said, what are you doing? She said, I'm running away, and he says to go back, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to get to this, because you get to verse 13, the, the, the crux of the story, and it says, it says um, God, the angel of the Lord says, you are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall, his name shall be Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. And basically gave, him this, gave her the same promise that he gave Abraham, that they would be numerous, her children would be numerous, okay? And then she gave, said, the Lord, has, she said, you, his name is for misery, for the Lord has heard your misery. Then she, Hagar, gave this name to the Lord, El Roi. He said, be, she said, because you are the God who sees me, I have now seen the one who sees me. So Hagar gives God the name El Roy. It's interesting because Abraham and Sarah have been waiting for the promise and, and lost patience. Have you ever been to a place God has given you a promise and you kind of are losing faith, losing hope? I, I, I've told you this, that 33 years ago, God gave me a dream I'd be pastoring in Lakeland with the school, right? And for 33 years, after 33 years, I started losing hope, like it was never going to happen. And then when my wife passed away, it was like, it's never going to happen. And how many of you know that when God gives you a promise, God gives you a promise, but remember this, it's not your timing because it's not your promise. It's the promise God gave to you, and God will fulfill that. So don't give up. Don't lose hope. I'm a living proof that God keeps his promise. And so here we see what happens when you jump the gun, when you get ahead of God and try to help God with the promise. Stop trying to help God. Stop trying to help God. So here's what happens. So she goes away. Hagar, we find Hagar and Hagar is leaving, she's leaving, she's fleeing, she is distressed, and she's very, very, very pregnant, and she goes off into the desert. I don't know about you, but that's not a real good place to be. Some of you were pregnant in Florida. Have you been pregnant in Florida? Okay, so it's like, kind of like being in the desert, um, only the problem is in the desert, there's no help, there's nobody there. The world was less populated. There's not as many people. We don't know what would happen to her. And it's interesting because in this story that God comes to her, and in verse 8, God speaks to her. And what does God do? Remember, she's a slave. She's a servant. She is basically owned by them, right? And she has fled because she was being mistreated by the ones who are supposed to be the promised ones from God. And she's being mistreated by them. And she's out here in the desert by a well, and God says, Hagar, go back. Did I, did I hear that correctly, God? Wait, do you know how they're treating me? You want me, to, you want me to go back to them? You want me to go back to being a servant? Go back to basically she's elevated to the status of a wife because she's about to give birth to Abraham's son, but yet she still is treated as a slave. But she obeys God. She goes back to a place where she knows she'll be mistreated, where she knows she'll be a second-class citizen. She goes back to that place because the God who sees, she now knew was watching over her. The God who sees her, God saw her. Listen to this, because this is gonna be hard. You ready? Sometimes God's protection and provision look nothing like what we expect. Amen. I'm gonna read that again, because it's really good. You can write that down really good. Sometimes God's protection and provision look nothing like what we expect it's going to look like. There are times where God will plant you where it is difficult. Ouch. Hagar, you're in the desert. You're not going to survive. So I want you to go back to a place that's very difficult because you're treated as a second-class citizen. You're going to give birth to a son that you won't even be able to raise as your own because it'll be Abraham's son. And I want you to go back there. You, what may happen is there are times when God plants us where it's difficult, and then we may begin to doubt and wonder if maybe we missed the boat. Maybe we missed it. Maybe we're thinking there's no way that God would call us to a difficult place. You ever thought that? Listen, God's going to call you to difficult places. But there's a reason for it. Because, listen, sometimes that difficult place is right where you need to be to survive. Get it? She wasn't going to survive in the desert. Pregnant. 
God sent her back to a place that was difficult because that's the only way she could survive. So sometimes God puts us in a place that's difficult because it's the place we need to be to survive. Sometimes God will lead you to a place where you need to survive now so that you can thrive later. Sometimes God will put you in a difficult situation because that's the only place that you can be to survive, but he's doing so because he knows that you will thrive later. You with me? That's what God does. That's the kind of God he is. Survive until you thrive. God knew what Hagar needed now, which was surviving, but what also he was going to do in her future and what she needed in her future. See, God sees you now, and he knows what you need. He sees you now, and he knows what you need. Now, this is the favorite part of that story, my favorite part of the story. Whenever Abraham and Sarah referred to Hagar, it was never Hagar. It was always your slave, your servant, my slave, my servant, depending on what translation you use. That's what, that's, that's what she was known as, my Egyptian slave, my Egyptian servant, your slave. But when you get to verse 8, when God speaks to her, the first thing God says to her, a slave, is Hagar. The God who created the heavens and the earth, who called Abraham out and said, I want you to go to a place that you don't know. I'm going to give you everything you need, and I'm going to make your, your ancestors as numerous as the stars of the sky. That same God that called Abraham out now is at a well with a slave girl who had no name because they didn't call her by her name, but God said Hagar. See, God knew her name because he had seen her. God knew her, he'd seen her. Of the eight billion people alive on planet Earth right now, you're one of them. Isn't that good? You're one of them. And I want you to know that there are times where you might be thinking, does anybody care? Does anybody see me? Does anybody know what's going on in my life? And I want you to know that of the 8 billion people on the planet right now, God sees you and he knows your name. He sees you and he knows your name. Matthew 10.30 says this, and some of you will like this better than others. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So for some of you, it's not quite the, the count that it used to be. But God still knows. It's just he has to count less for some of, some of you. That's how much God cares about you. That's how much God knows you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. Psalm 139, 13, 14 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Here's a God who created us. How can the God who created us do anything but care about us, see us, and know us by name. He created us. Not only in the good parts of our life, but Psalm 69, 5 says this, you, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. God sees us in our messiness. God sees us in our secret sins. And he still knows us and he still calls us by name. Psalm 90, verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. God sees our ugly, messy lives. God sees our failures, our addictions, our pain, our frailties, and still loves us. Amen. Because he sees us. And he knows our name. In spite of how many times I mess up, God still calls me by name because he sees me. And God sees you and your situation. One more story. There's this guy, Elijah. You may have heard of him. And real quick, it's from 1 Kings 19. I'm not going to take time to read all that. But what happens is in, in that story, in this part of the story, Elijah is running away. He's discouraged. He's depressed. He's running away, and he goes and hides. Now, I want to tell you what happened before that. Before that, Elijah calls out Jezebel and 850 prophets and priests of, 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 of Asheroth and Baal. 
and he challenged him to a duel, a good old Western showdown, high noon. And they're there praying, 850 prophets, they're there praying, and the Bible says that they were yelling, screaming, cutting themselves. And Elijah starts mocking them. I mean, that's what we would do too, right? Elijah starts mocking them. Hey, and one, the, the Living Translation says this. Hey, why don't you yell a little louder? Maybe your God's on the toilet. <laughs> so he's mocking them. And they're cutting themselves. And, and, and they've set up a, a, a sacrifice here. And, and they want to call down fire from heaven. And they go all day and nothing happens. Then Elijah gets up. It's a time of drought because he said it's not going to rain. Takes water pours it over top of the sacrifice, prays a 53-word prayer, and fire comes down from heaven and consumes the fact, consumes everything. It's gone. That's what just happened before the story I just told you. Now, I don't know about you, but if God calls fire from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, I'm going to be full of faith, right? I'm going to conquer the world. Let's go. Let's do this thing, people. But Jezebel sends word and says, I'm going to kill you. I'm coming after you. And Elijah runs away into the wilderness, discouraged and depressed. You ever felt that way? Right? One day you're conquering the world. You're full of faith. God is with you, and you want it. Let's do it all. Let's get this thing done. And the next day you can't get out of bed. That's okay. That's normal. That doesn't mean you lack faith. It's just life. Right? And we're human. But the God that sees us calling fire from heaven, we heard from Elijah, also sees us hiding in the wilderness. Because Elijah was hiding in the wilderness, running away from God, running away from Jezebel. So what happens? What happens is this, that God, God sees him. And I love this because this is what happened in my life. There's something biblical about a nap and a snack. Elijah took a nap, and God provided a snack. And suddenly, he was better. So I encourage you to take naps and eat snacks. Yes. Now, if you gain weight because of that, don't blame me. You choose your snack wisely. I choose Hershey Almond. Elijah had run quite a distance into the wilderness, but even there in the wilderness, it, the, the God who had called, he had called fire from heaven and God presented the fire, burned it up, and when Elijah ran away, you would think God would be like, come on, Elijah, where's your faith? I just called fire from heaven, I burned it up for you, we killed the 850, but where's your faith? But that's not what God does. God sees him running in the wilderness, hiding. And God doesn't come down and condemn him. Nope. God provides what he needs. And in fact, if we read the rest of that story, the angel comes to him and says, get up and eat. Your journey's too much for you. And he does. He feeds him a couple of times because he has to travel for 40 days. Because see, here's the thing. The God who sees, saw Elijah call fire from heaven, the God who sees now him discouraged and depressed and hiding in the wilderness from from the, the queen is also the God that sees him and knows exactly what Elijah needed now and for the next challenge that he's about to face. Because see, God's not just concerned about where you are now. He's also working on what he's about to do in your life. And he doesn't look at your circumstance and say, well, he's discouraged right now, so I can't use him. He looks and says, I don't see you that way. Here, eat, get ready for the next challenge. Because God knows us and God sees us. The God who sees also knows exactly what we need. God is not blind to our plight. God is not scared of our circumstances. God is not ever taken by surprise because God knows your situation. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. See, God's not just for those who are full of faith calling fire from heaven. God's for the broken, the discouraged, the downtrodden, the believers who are struggling in their faith. God's for you. God is with you because God sees you and God knows you. 
God knows you. Because God sees us and knows our situation, so whether you are under a fig tree in isolation like Nathaniel, or you're in the desert running from what has happened to you like Hagar, or maybe you're in the wilderness discouraged and depressed like Elijah, God sees you. God knows you, and he knows what you need. Psalm 139, 7 and 12 says this, one more time this morning. Where can I go from your spirit, David says? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You think that you can hide in your darkness, but even the darkness is light to him. And he will meet you in your darkness because he's not afraid of your situation. When the darkness has you surrounded, there's no need to worry, no need to fear, because our God, El Roi, the God who sees, can see in the dark. That's the kind of God we serve. And he's ready and willing to sustain you this morning.